is fourth, followed by Sunny Isle Beach. The field is in the stretch, and it is Golden Pal in hand here with an eighth of a mile to the finish. Golden Pal opening up here by almost five lengths. Golden Pal will get his maiden victory in Saratoga Skidmore Stakes, and he did it impressively. Welcome back to the Racing Rundown here on YouTube. I'm Eric DeCoster. In this preview, we will be looking at the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint as the first race on Future Stars Friday. First race of the Breeders', Breeders Cup. Obviously, everybody is looking forward to this race because it kicks off what's going to be a great weekend of racing. Of course, we already have a couple previews out. This uh, this being the, the one that will matter most at the beginning because it is the first race. It's a grade two, but we all know what, what a Breeders' Cup entails no matter the grade. It, it, it's only a grade two because it's its third year of existence. It's it's the baby of the Breeders' Cup races. The young, it's the youngest one. Only two times this race has been ran uh, to this point. Uh, both winners were American-based. Both were speedballs. Both were low-priced. Both were undefeated coming in. And I think those are trends that might just last uh, another year more as we look at this race. 14 horses contend. We're going to touch on all of them like we do in all of our previews with picks at the end as always. But at the end of the day, of course, we're here to inform, and especially Breeders' Cup. There are so many different ways to look. I'm going to mention horses that I like on paper, but I have to dismiss because I have to obviously cut it down to ultimately a top two or three to, 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 give, to, to give out as my top choices. But when I say I like a horse, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm picking them, but I think there is good reason, and I could find reasons why people would look at them. Let's waste no more time and start with the one, Mighty Gurkha. This is one of a couple Europeans in this race. Mighty Gurkha, one of the more impressive debut winners we've seen in Europe. I follow as many of the English and Irish maiden races as I can. This guy was dominant on debut back in June by seven and a half lengths over an all-weather surface. Only one win since, though, in five starts. Uh, he's actually the most veteran horse in the race in terms of experience. Six career races. He did win a Group 3 two-back, also on the all-weather. So his only two wins have come on synthetic surfaces over in, over in England. And then uh, only one really bad race. The last race was not very impressive. He was 10th in a, in a in a listed race at Newmarket, well beaten on the day. That was a very disappointing run from a horse that probably could have been a good contender heading into this. He does seem to he does like to run close up to the lead, either on the lead or just off of it. Problem is he does not have the greatest gate speed. Now he does add blinkers, and he's going to have starters in the gate with them, which we don't always see with Euro shipping into America. So that could perhaps help him, but. I, and I really liked this horse coming into the draw, but after the draw, he drew the rail. There is so much speed to his outside. He is not going to be able to make the lead, which is where he wants to be. And he's probably not going to like being covered up by a bunch of different horses. A very new experience for him. For that reason, I do have to look against him, despite of the fact that I, I do really like this horse a lot. Um, just as a racehorse, unfortunately, on paper, not a lot going for him, so I do have to pass. The two is Windy City Red. He's going to be the biggest long shot in this year's Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Broke his maiden at Golden Gate at spring, uh, on Labor Day weekend, start number one. Then shipped down to Southern California, tried the grass out for the first time in the Speakeasy. That's the listed winning your in race over at Santa Anita for this race. And he ran a really good third, closed very well from off the pace, sat about mid-pack, closed very well into a swift pace, uh, wasn't able to catch him on the Impolo or Wi-Fire, uh, but he ran a good race nonetheless. I was impressed by it. However, that's not a very that, that's not a very strong race. That's not going to be a key race coming in here. I'm I'm not super high on this guy because he, he that race in general is very weak. There are better horses in this race he's facing. In addition to that being an overall weak prep race for this juvenile turf sprint, for that reason I am against him. The race does set up well for him. So if I was to say one positive thing about him, we know he likes to come from he can come from a bit off the pace and be efficient. Efficient. So so that does that does look good for him because there's going to be tons of speed in this race. The three is Lipizaner. Lipizaner, Kentucky bred son of Uncle Mo, but is owned by Coolmore and trained by Aiden O'Brien. So obviously based in Ireland. He's had seven runs in his career, so he's actually the most uh, seasoned horse in this race. No surprise being a Euro. He uh, He's ran some really good races in his career, including his win last time out at Doncaster in a, in a listed stakes they had going six furlongs. In that race, he beat a horse named Just Frank. Just Frank beat Mighty Gurkha in his last race. So we do have some overlapping form in this juvenile turf sprint race. Lipizaner, based on that logic, is technically better than Mighty Gurkha. And I do think in general, he's probably a little bit better. He's ran two really good races in a row. Also group three placed two back. Um, he ran in the Norfolk this summer. Uh, in a, the same race, Golden Powell was second in that Royal Ascot in June. 
Um, he ran a fine race there as well. He is a closer. He does not have a lot of early speed, and he does kind of grind away, and I don't think that's going to be beneficial to him. Uh, he doesn't really have a huge turn of foot and a turf sprint coming from off the pace. That is a huge disadvantage. Uh, in addition, he's never gone around a, a turn in a race. That's, that's another disadvantage we see a lot of Euros run into when they ship over for Breeders' Cups is they've never been around a turn before, and it really compromises them because – Unlike American turf sprinters, they don't have that rapid turn of foot and quick acceleration. They slowly grind out their sprint wins. And for that reason, uh, that's another reason I don't like Lipizzaner or really any of the Euros in this race. The Forest County Final, that's one of two in here for Steve Asmussen. County Final got up to a really good start to his career, was two for three uh, to begin his career with a win on grass and his maiden special weight score, uh, including uh, the first two races weren't with Asmussen. He was privately or, uh, he was sold at auction and, and acquired by a group that, you know, made Asmussen the trainer. He won his first start with Asmussen, but his last two runs have been very disappointing. Fourth in the juvenile turf sprint at Kentucky Downs. That was a tough race. Um, that was over a, a, a soft going, so that could have been a bit of, big excuse, which gave me confidence going into his next start, the Futurity at, uh, at Belmont. But he was fourth on that day, and he made the lead halfway down the stretch for a brief moment and just did not carry that on with him. That's a little concerning to me that he's not he did not finish that race off. I do honestly think he's done his best work on the dirt too. And at the end of the day, he got three by beat by three horses in this, uh, in that are all in the futurity that are also in this race. And so that is a little bit concerning to me. And uh, really, he had no excuses that day. We'll talk a lot about how I believe the futurity is a big uh, key is a is a key race to analyze uh, for this juvenile turf sprint field. The five is Cowan. This is the other Steve Asmussen represent representee in this group. Uh, he ran a really good second in the local prep, the Indian Summer. Uh, over this course and distance last time out was second behind Bodenheimer, but he did not get the best trip in my opinion. Ricardo Santana took him back second last. That was a perfect place to be off a quick pace. But then as it came around the turn, Santana took him out on the turn. He did not, he had the rail open, did not take it. Cowan lost some ground. He had probably lost the length that was required to catch Bodenheimer. Not saying he would have beat him, but he would have made it closer. And I do think Cowan provides, he is eight to one morning line. My guess is he does either stay around there or float up ever so slightly. Either way, I do think he provides some good value. He's going to be one of the nicer, longer shots, especially with the heavy favorite or two we're going to see in this race. He, provide, he provides value. We know he likes the surface. He's going to have the right closing setup with the quick pace, and uh, he, he's, 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 he's proven he can do it now. Uh, he just needs to get the, be- the good ride to go along with it. And I think he can. I think Ricardo Santana can learn from that. And, uh, and put him at least he's gonna, he can be in contention to, to, to finish out his try or a super. The six is you better believe it. This is the last of the Europeans I will uh, we will be talking about because he's the last one in the race. Three for four lifetime or three for four uh, in his most recent starts. Three for five lifetime. Last out one was very impressive. Won the group two flying childers at Doncaster. That was going five furlongs. Very decent time by European standards um, in that race over the over that going. It was a good one. One by a nose. He was a bit of a long shot, though, because two back, he lost a another group two by near 30 lengths, dead last. Uh, the form from that race is strong in front of him, some, some some stakes winners in front of him. But at the end of the day, that was a disappointing effort. But he's been better at five furlongs. My knock on him, and the reason I don't like him, is he does not have good gate speed. And uh, it's kind of the same boat as Lipizzaner, uh, the three horse who I was talking about, the bend, and the, you know, never being around the turn. He's a horse that sustains his runs. He's not a, you know flip the switch and take off rocket kind of horse he, like like we typically see with our American turf sprinters, he really grinds it out. And that bend is only going to hinder that ability to grind that out because he's going to have to obviously, you know, slow down a little to, to carry his speed around the bend. And it just, it doesn't look good for him. Uh, and I, 20 to one, I think is reasonable on, on the prize. And if you, if you, if you like him, I, I, I can kind of understand it based off the pure form. You know, you look at the, that, that line of four, one, one, nine, one right there that you look at, uh, with in terms of his his performances, but at the end of the day, looking at it logistically, he, he's not going to, you know, this is something very new to him, and he's going to have to overcome a lot of difficult things that he's never faced before against far superior horses to me that he's faced than he's faced to this point. Seven is Momos for Christophe Clement made his turf debut in the Futurity last time out. Finished a really good third. Go back and watch that replay. He was on the lead. Looked beaten quite a few times throughout this race, but ultimately he dug in, finished third, beat just a length, uh, and he led after five and a half furlongs. That last 16th is what got him. So the fact he has to shorten up in this race by even that extra 16th of a mile um, is going to really do do him wonders. Uh, the the big knock for me is he's he's going to have to really duke it out on the front end with some really fast Wesley Ward horses. But 
uh, because he, he went very slow in the futurity for, for six furlongs on the grass. That, that was not quick early on, but he ran a good race. 15-1, to 1, I feel like there's value to be had there. Could be one you could use underneath in terms of, you know, speed that sticks. Uh, for me, I, 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 I considered him for a while in, in, in that spot, but ultimately there are other horses I just like more. I can see a case being made for him, but for me, uh, he's one of those last few I have to look against. The eight is the first of four for Wesley Ward we'll discuss, as well as the three also eligibles. Amanzi Yimpolo, we already mentioned her briefly when she uh, discussing the speakeasy that she won. Very good run there. She went very quick early on and still stuck it out. But she did get tired late. She got very tired late. The time, the final time reflects that. 102 and 3 for five and a half furlongs, especially over at Santa Anita, which that turf course is usually a, a tarmac with how quick it is. She, 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 she got very tired late, finished up pretty slow, was lucky to not get beat by the runner up or the third place finisher in that spot. In addition, came back with a very slow speed figure as a result. She's good. She has talent. However, you go back to that race two back. She was beaten by Toby's Heart and Joy's Rocket, who are very good young young female sprinters, but at the end of the day, would not be big, you know would not be highly regarded against the favorites in this race. And Amanzi Impolo was well beaten by them on that day. Went out to California, caught an easy group, won impressively, you know, by her standards in terms of you know how fast she went and the fact she stuck around. But realistically, against this group, she has to do a lot, and I just don't see it happening with some of the other horses in this race. The nine is after five. Another Wesley Ward. This is a horse who was six to one on the morning line, and I am advising you now. This is a play against. This is one of my firmest look against in all of the all of the Breeders' Cup, the fourteen races we're going to look at over the over the next two days and this week. I don't like him at all. If if he's six to one, that is that is a very big, very big overlay. He, he's a mate, but he's ran two really good races. He was second to Trey Deal, who was on the also eligible list for this race in his debut at Kentucky Downs. And then he was second in the futurity, beaten a half length at Belmont. That's very good. That's a very good form right there based off who he's been losing to in the races he's been running. He's grade three placed. The problem is those races are longer than this. And he has been coming from behind, trying to close into those races. And he's been, he's been, he's missed late both times. In addition, the futurity, you got to go back and watch the futurity because he got so lazy down the backside and th- throughout that second and third furlong, he had no early run, and as a result, he lost some ground under I. Red Ortiz Jr. He went from being right up in the firing line to second, but second to last and last, and he had too much ground to make up, and he was coming late, and it was very good, but all of these signs, in addition to the pedigree, lead me to believe he just needs more distance than this, and he's, he's obviously lazy. He already has blinkers on, so we, he can't get more sharp than he already is, and at the end of the day... He just needs more ground than this. He's going to be coming late, but he's going to be well beat. He's going to be well short of the, of the winner's pace because he just wants to run more and more, and he's not getting that. So I think he's a great horse. He's obviously very promising. Problem is he is running way too short than, than, he, than he probably wants to be, and that's why I think he's so beatable, and especially at that price. The 10 is Bodenheimer. Bodenheimer is also pretty highly regarded, 8-1 to one morning line, 3-4 for four lifetime, Last time out, stole the Indian summer going wire to wire at Keeneland. Very impressive win. That's the one where he beat Cowan. Two starts back his turf debut. He was fifth in the juvenile turf sprint. That was a race where he was not on the lead. Uh, he was sat second. He obviously did not like it. He, he backed up pretty severely. Uh, he was fifth out of 10 in the race, beating six lengths. Though. So he was well beaten on the day. Ran a fine race, no doubt. But, but that Indian summer was much better. I think the five and a half is better for him in that spot compared to the six and a half he ran at Kentucky down. So that's a positive. My big worry is how quick he's going to get battled because there's other speed presences in here. I'm going to keep referring to it, especially through these last few horses. Um, And I do wonder how, how he's going to handle that pressure because he hasn't faced that before. Um, I do think he is a live contender in this race, but for me, I am looking other directions. The 11 is into the sunrise. It's another speed contender. This is one. I think is the best value of the race at 15 to one into the sunrise broke his maiden in his turf debut and career start number two, three starts ago at Ellis park. He went extremely fast. The only horse who has gone that quick for an opening half mile, first four furlongs in this race is the favorite golden pal 44 and one for a half mile is pretty quick. Now the final time wasn't great, but the fact he was able to sustain that early speed and carry it all the way around that track to win the race was very impressive. Even better, in his last two starts, he has been second and fourth 
behind Gretzky the Great and Mudasabek. Those are two of your favorites for the juvenile turf. The next race on the card, they are going to be highly regarded. And he ran Gretzky the Great to the wire, going six and a half for a long, beating just a neck. And he ran a very good race on the front end, finishing fourth, beating just three lengths in the bourbon last time out. Now he cuts back, and there's really nothing better. I don't know how many better angles there are than the speed that goes a, route of, a longer distance, able to hold but, near, but barely loses, and then cuts back. I think that that is a beautiful angle in any circumstance. And Into the Sunrise fits that mold perfectly. He's got the pedigree that we already know he can go to five and a half. And he's probably more of a sprinter. But the pedigree even, you know, helps him out there. I think this horse, like I said, he's not my top pick. But I think he provides great value at that morning line price. The 12 is Dirty Dangle. Another horse I think has great morning, uh, great value based off the morning line. Undefeated 2 for 2. This is a filly. Uh, this will be a first start for Mark Cassie from the the barn of Canadian trainer Ralph Biamonti. Uh, two wins and two starts, like I said, one at stakes at Woodbine last time out. The quality of the field she's not beating is great, but visually she has done the job for me. This will be her longest race. She's only ran five furlongs before, but she's done it very well. That win last time out in the Woodbine cares at Woodbine, that minor stakes, she really did not get asked for much. She obviously had more left in the tank. Biggest thing, I think, with Dirty Dangle is her outside post and the fact she's going to be coming from off the page. Those are two really enticing things, especially with how this race is going to be shaping up. Speed, for the most part, will be backing up, other than a couple that, I, that I'll obviously mention here at the end that I like. But I think Dirty Dangle, of the horses coming from off the pace, has a very good chance because she's, been, she's done nothing wrong in her first two races. And I only think she can improve, and I love her being in the Mark Cassie barn. In the 13th second of July, another one here. That's two for two. This is a gelding that won the Futurity at Belmont in his last start. But he's needed, he's won both of his races going six furlongs, and he's needed every bit of those six furlongs. Now he cuts back that extra 16th of a mile, he cuts back that half furlong, and I'm very skeptical of it because, like I said, he needed all the real estate he had in those previous races, and now he loses the distance that, that, he, that he basically made it all up in. So that, for me, is concerning. I think he's a very good horse, but I would have loved to have seen him stretch out for the juvenile turf rather than cut back for the juvenile turf sprint. Uh, and like I said, he, he's he's looked really great on paper, but that's just my biggest knock. I don't know how he's going to handle that. I do like, though, that he is coming from off the pace because, like I said, there is going to be some speed that falls. He could be coming for some minor pieces, but ultimately not a win contender. And the 14, the horse I think everybody's here for, Golden Pal, only one win in three starts, but if you've been following this horse, you know his deal. Second beaten just a neck in the Group 2 Norfolk Stakes at Royal Ascot this year. That was a huge race he ran, especially given the circumstances and the soft ground. Last time out won the Skidmore very impressively. Now I'm going to be honest. Golden Powell coming into the draw, I viewed as a very beatable favorite. But looking at that last race, I don't think he gets beat in this spot. I think he's a lock, even though he is the favorite. It's, it's hard to pick favorites, especially to kick things off with the Breeders' Cup, but no horse running in any of the Breeders' Cup turf sprint races this this year have ran a sub one minute, one second, a sub 101, five and a half furlongs this year. That is incredible to me. You go to that you go to that day, the Skidmore, that, that Golden Pal won. There were two other turf sprints that day, same distance uh, for allowance horses, male races. And they went 101 and three and 101 and two. That further proves that that race was an insanely freaky performance from Golden Pal. Love the outside post. We know he can sustain his early speed. He's done it in his last two races. And unless he has something very wrong with him, there is no reason he's going to lose this, this Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. I think he's an absolute lock. And, of course, trained by Wesley Ward, which makes it all the better. Your last three horses on the also eligible list, all three trained by Wesley Ward. The 15th lane, the booze, was ninth in the bourbon last time out. Hard to see him running well should he draw in. The 16th, Gypsy King. Uh, he's been fifth in both the uh, Kentucky Downs Juvenile and the Futurity at Thelma. And the 17 trade deal was sixth in the Futurity, but he did beat after five in his maiden score. So there was some good form behind him. Ultimately, for me, I mean, well, let's first look at this pace setup. Like I said, Golden Powell is going to be on the lead into the sun Sunrise. And Bodenheimer is going to be his chief rival on the front end. Into the Sunrise is going to be right there as well. Then you're going to have Momos and Amanzi Impolo right up in the firing line as well. Right behind them, I envision seeing Mighty Gurkha and County Final. They'll probably be sitting 6th and 7th with Windy City Red right there as well. Uh, Count Cowan and uh, Dirty Dangle right behind them. And then your four horses that are that are def definitive closers are going to be Lipizaner, um, you better believe it, after 5, and finally 2nd of July. Ultimately, like I said, Golden Pal I think is a lock in this race. 
based off the form, everything points to him winning this race purely from a time standpoint. Figures wise, he's obviously the best. He's going to get the best trip. And we, he, like I said, the only reason he can lose this race is if he, it, he's off his A game, which I don't think he would be if he were to run. For underneath, I'm going to go with the 12, Dirty Dangle. I love that she's coming from off the pace. Love that she's going to be able to get an outside trip, stay away from that fading traffic. She's been ran two really good races and Mark Cassie does some really good things with horses first time out by his standard. So I think she could run a big race. And if I were to give out a third horse, it would be the 11 into the sunrise. Like I said, I think that he has some great value. Don't know how well he's going to handle that pressure he's going to have from his stable mate in Bodenheimer, but I think he's still going to run a fine race. Ultimately for me, 14, 12, 11 in this year's Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. But at the end of the day, I just hope I can help you guys pick a winner, find some value in this race. Maybe some of those long shots I did give out are ones you weren't looking at, but are now going to consider putting on your on your tickets uh, come Juvenile Turf Sprint time. Everybody enjoy the Breeders' Cup. Obviously, we're going to have tons of more preview action coming your way over the next day or two. And uh, please stay tuned because it's going to be going to be great. We'll see you next time on the Racing Rundown. People second a length. And then Petit Verdot is in third. Cowan looks for running room, shifting lanes toward the inside. Now has clear running, but is five lengths off the lead. And the leader is Bodenheimer coming to the 16th pole. Bodenheimer by five. Cowan is still back in second position, 44.56 for that opening half mile. Bodenheimer chased by Cowan. Here comes the line. Bodenheimer, Brian Hernandez Jr. and Bodenheimer to take the Indian summer.